Anyway, we're continuing in our, our uh, sermon series, Majoring on the Minors, looking at Obadiah today. And I think these are books that have probably, to a large degree, a lot of Christians have never read them. That's not a, a slam on, on Christians. I think it's, we like to go to those places that we're more familiar with and maybe a little easier to understand. We probably spend a lot more time in the New Testament, particularly maybe the Gospels or reading some of the epistles of Paul. I'm free, freely admitting that I would probably spend all my time reading Paul's epistles if I you know, just were left to where I like to usually be. I love reading the epistles of Paul. But there are, the whole Bible, all of it, is inspired by God for our instruction. And so I'm, I'm hoping that we're learning some things here and there. And, and I also, my goal also is I want you to be able to, in your own reading, gain instruction from the Word, all of it. And, uh, you know, we, we do it ourselves, I think, a disservice if we don't look at all of it. So anyway, all of that to say this. How many of you have, have or had a brother or sister? Anyone? Yeah, probably most of us. I mean, I'm sure there are some only childs out, out there, but most of us have had a sibling or two, right? So I have an older brother and I have an older sister. My brother is the oldest, so I'm the baby and my sister's in the middle. Again, I'm gonna have you go back in your memory bank a little bit. Those of you who had a, a sibling of the same gender, did you ever have to share a bedroom or maybe even share a bed? Yeah, yeah. So my brother and I shared a bed, and if you just were to envision that this, you know, this area was the bed, there was an imaginary and yet very real barrier right down the middle, right? There was a line. I mean, you didn't see that line. I can remember many uh, conversations, we'll call them at night. The line's right here, you're over the line. I was never over the line, my brother was always over the line. Just want to establish that for the record. And um, he's probably gonna watch this later. He tends to watch these sermons, so he's gonna, he's gonna know that everybody knows just the kind of nonsense he was up to crossing the uh, very real and yet imaginary line. There's this, I, this, this concept of sibling rivalry, right? And, and boy, some, some kids really go at it against each other, don't they? Well, we actually have a story of that, and it absolutely is involved in our look at Obadiah. Obadiah is a prophecy concerning Edom. Well, what what in the world's Edom? Edom is the nation that comes from Esau, and Israel is the nation that comes from Jacob. Well, Jacob and Esau were twins, and so they... They were even having sibling rivalry in the womb. I mean, that's real sibling rivalry there. You talk about starting off rough, you know. They had to be in the same place there and get along. That's, those are tight quarters. But let's go ahead and take a look for a, for a bit of background. We're going to go back to Genesis chapter 25, as it does have bearing on what we're going to look at in Obadiah. So Genesis chapter 25, verses 21 through 26 And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her and she said, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other the older shall serve the younger. This is what I want my brother to understand, (laughs) is that the older needs to be serving the younger. I'm going to remind him of that as well. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Okay. (laughs) When her days to give birth (laughs) were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. 
And Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. You, you can read of the sibling rivalry between Jacob and Esau when you go home. Uh, some of you, if you've already read Obadiah, you already got that. So now you can go back home and read Genesis and you read through, you'll see all of this all of the, the play back and forth between these guys over the years and the sibling rivalry, this, this constant strife between them because it continued for centuries between those two nations. Obadiah prophesies to Edom that God will ultimately judge them. And so basically we're looking in this prophecy at the downfall and destruction of the nation of Edom who is this sibling of Israel. And it was their pride that was their downfall. And what I want us to see as we look in this prophecy of Obadiah, as we look at the destruction of Edom, I want you to consider the, the fact that just as pride was the downfall of Edom, you know what? Pride is the downfall of mankind, isn't it? Pride is the downfall of you and I. Uh, there's, there's no anybody pointing fingers at anyone. Pride's one of those things. It's, it's a we thing. It's a us thing. <laughs> it's something we all deal with, isn't it? But Obadiah's prophecy teaches us that we're self-deceived. Pride deceives us. Pride leads us to sin, and pride will ultimately lead to destruction. Now, these two nations are more than just a story of sibling rivalry. They teach us about pride and its destructive impact in our own lives. The people of Edom had great confidence in their position. They were people who dwelled in a very secure place. They had a, a place that was up in the cliffs and was secure and surrounded by things that, that put them in a very secure location. It was very hard to, to defeat Edom because of the, the natural kind of fortress that, that they had. Uh, John MacArthur describes it this way. He said, dwelling in difficult mountain terrain, Edom's imposing, impregnable capital city of Petra was virtually inaccessible, giving her a sense of security and self-sufficiency. Deep, terrifying gorges emanating from peaks reaching 5,700 feet surrounded her like a fortress, generating a proud, false sense of security. Now I decided today I wanted to actually show you uh, a little bit of what, what we're, where we're talking about. How many of you love maps? I love map. Maps and charts. I, I'm, I'm a junkie for those. And uh, you know, you're, you're, we're looking at the, the books of the minor prophets and we've, we've looked in the books in the New Testament. I've preached through Ephesians and, and 2 Timothy. But how many of you have read the book of maps in your Bible? It's usually right after Revelation, book of maps. You've never seen that? All right, it's not, it's not part of the Bible, but it's in your Bible probably. In fact, if you have a Bible that doesn't have maps in it, you know what you should probably do? Yeah, get a Bible with maps in it, absolutely. Um, because it'll help when you, some of the, particularly when you're reading in some of these prophecies and they're mentioning locations and you're like, well, I don't know where that is. Well, there's a Bible map that will show you. So that little section of yellow there on the bottom is Edom, right directly below Judah there, the southern portion of the nation of Israel. And so these guys shared a border and they shared a whole lot of grief between one another. Obadiah chapter, uh, excuse me, verses three and four says, the pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Edom was a proud nation, and it was that pride that led them to think that they were invincible. They were surrounded by rocks and things that, that kind of made a fortress for them. And you know, we have, we have people, don't we, who have surrounded their lives with things that, that make them feel like they're strong. And maybe it's a large bank account. 
Maybe it's their career. Maybe it's a position of prestige and power and influence and all of these things that are, that are almost a fortress that makes them feel like, I've, I've really got it together and I've got everything and I'm, I'm in, invincible and I'm impenetrable. You know, one day all of us will stand naked before the Lord. We won't have any of our stuff. Edom was proud, having no idea what was coming. They lived a life not fearing God. And in fact, they might have even laughed at the idea of an eternal judgment. And we know people like that, don't we? And we try to, we try to warn them. We t- try to tell them there, there's a righteous judge that we're going to stand before. Are you ready to meet him? Ha! Crazy talk. Self-deception. You see, pride really does deceive us. There's an interesting story from history. During the Battle of the Wilderness and the Civil War, Union General John Sedgwick was inspecting his troops. And at one point he came to a parapet over which he gazed out in the direction of the enemy and his officers suggested that this was unwise and perhaps he ought to duck while passing. Nonsense, snapped the general. They couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. And a moment later, he fell to the ground, fatally wounded. (laughs) Now, you could probably go back in history and find many, many accounts of overconfident people who were led to their ultimate demise because of their own pride, right? Edom was one of these who fits that category. One of the things that pride does is it convinces us to believe things about ourselves that are not true. Edom was convinced of its invincibility. There there were alliances that they had relied upon. They were guys that they thought were their friends. Nations around them, these are our friends, these are our allies. These were the very ones that deceived them. All your allies, verse 7, have driven you to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. They have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you. You have no understanding. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of Mount Esau? And your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Teman, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. It's interesting to note also that the nation of Edom was very proud of the fact they would have people from the east would come and wise sages and such, and they were very proud of all the wisdom that they had in the nation of Edom. And God says, I will destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of Mount Esau. Any wisdom that places itself above God's wisdom is really not anything too wise, is it? But those in in whom Edom had trusted had failed them. And and clearly these allies had gained Edom's trust and only to turn around and deceive them. And there's a lesson here for us. I want you to think for just a moment about this idea. What kinds of people do you surround yourself with? It's tempting to surround yourself with people who will only tell you things that you want to hear, like... Wow, Ron, you're a good looking guy. You know, see? You know, wouldn't it be nice to surround yourself with people who would tell you things like that if you could find them anywhere? You see where that went real quick? You thought I was an ally, a friend, and then it went, that's kind of what happened to Edom. You see where I went with that? That was terrible, sorry. Um, but we like, to, we like to have people around us who tell us the things that we want to hear, don't we? We like to hear that we're on the ball, we're great, we're awesome, and that everything we do is admirable. We, we like to gather around people who tell us what we want to hear. You know one of the most beneficial things for a, a follower of Jesus Christ is to find someone in your life who's willing to tell you things you don't want to hear. You need to find someone who cares about you enough to say, I really don't think that's a good choice. What you're about to do is going to put a roadblock between you and your relationship with Christ. You sure you want to go down that road? 
You sure you want to make that decision? Edom thought that it had real good friends. It had real good allies that it could trust, but it was wrong. And I'm sure that those allies told Edom things they wanted to hear. Be careful who you hang around with. If your so-called friends are leading you to do things that are contrary to what the word of God says, if your so-called friends are encouraging you to prioritize things that scripture doesn't prioritize, they're not your friends. We, we only like to hear positive things, don't we? In fact, there are, there are actually churches around who when you walk in, the only thing you will ever hear is how wonderful you are, how great you are, how awesome you are, and let's sing songs that talk about how awesome we are. And God's just lucky to have us. Maybe you've heard of churches that preach what they call positive confession. Right? You ever heard of that? Anyone? That's where you only, you only speak words that are positive because they'll say, well, your words have power to create things and make things happen. Even though scripture only attributes that to God himself, not to us. But anyway, and they'll say, well, you don't ever say that so-and-so has cancer. That's negative. You say, that person is healed. I declare it. I declare that they're healed. But they're not. So instead of it being positive, it's rather delusional. But you see, we like to hear what we want to hear. Sometimes we need to hear things we don't want to hear. I encourage you to find some good, godly friends who are willing to tell you the truth. In fact, find some good, godly friends who will, who will say things like this to you. Hey, how's your prayer life going? How's your, how's your reading of the word going? Uh, maybe we can read something together. Maybe we can talk about it. Find a friend like that. We need friends. We need people who, Edom had some pretty bad friends, right? We need to have some friends that won't just tell us what our prideful heart wants to hear, but rather will tell us things that will encourage us in our walk with Christ. I, I wonder how many marriages would not have fallen into adultery and divorce if a godly friend would have said, hey, I see you hanging around that other person at, at, at work. That, that's not good. You probably, should, you probably should back away from that. I wonder how many marriages wouldn't have fallen into destruction if a good godly friend would have come alongside and said, hey, I care about you. I'm concerned. What are you doing? Maybe you can find a friend like that. Maybe you can be a friend like that. Because I'm going to tell you, this Christian walk, it's not for the faint of heart. It's not easy. Anybody that wants to tell you being a Christian is easy, it's not. Difficult. You're going to have to make some real hard choices at times. There's going to be times where you're going to be mocked, made fun of, put down, in fact, maybe even treated differently in, in very awful ways. And so we need people that will tell us the truth, encourage us, and help us along, right? We need each other desperately. I wonder how many people would not have fallen into some sin if someone would have said, hey, you're not strong enough to, to, to face that temptation alone, but I, I'm, I'm praying for you and let, I want to pray with you. I want to help you. And when you're feeling really in the midst of that temptation, give me a call. We'll get together. I want to be an encouragement for you. Edom fell and it was pride that led it into the deception and pride leads us into sin. Let's look at verses 9 through 12 of our text here. It says, And your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Teman, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. But do not gloat over the day of your brother in the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. 
So over the years, what Edom did is when when Israel fell into trouble and and fell under attack, what did Edom do? (laughs) Look at you guys, that's too bad for you. And they gloated over any time that Israel struggled. And in fact, looking down a little further, when Babylon comes to take off Judah into captivity, Edom was there gloating, siding with Babylon. And a few years later, Babylon came for them. Judah returned, Edom never did. These verses are are talking about Edom looking down on Israel and and gloating over them. That this entire history of the relationship between Edom and Israel is one of, of Edom looking down upon and, and, and fighting against its younger, a younger brother. It's interesting because it was God's sovereign will from the beginning. And Edom knew, uh, Esau knew that the prophecy that had been told to his mother that the older would serve the younger, and yet he rebelled against God's sovereign direction. Numbers 20, verses 14 through 21, just gives us a little bit of a glimpse of how this dynamic played out. You remember the uh, people of Israel are, are, uh, have escaped Egypt and they're going to enter the promised land. Well, there's this nation right in the way of going to their promised land. What was it? Anybody want to guess? Yeah, there you go, Edom. <laughs> yeah, there's old Edom right there in the way. Well, we got to go through Edom to get to where we're going, or at least we'd like to. So here's this account in Numbers chapter 20, verses 14 through 21. Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Thus says your brother, Israel, you know all the hardship that we have met, how our fathers went down to Egypt and we lived in Egypt a long time and the Egyptians dealt harshly with us and our fathers. And when we cried to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us out of Egypt. And here we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your territory. Please let us pass through your land. We will not pass through field or vineyard or drink water from a well. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right hand or to the left until we have passed through your territory. But Edom said to him, you shall not pass through lest I come out with a sword against you. And the people of Israel said to him, we will go up by the highway. And if we drink of your water, I and my livestock, then I will pay for it. Let me only pass through on foot, nothing more. But he said, you shall not pass through. And Edom came out against them with a large army and with a strong force. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory. So Israel turned away from him. Thankfully, my wife gets the joke. The rest of you will have to figure it out, okay? (laughs) God's chosen people were of Israel. God had told Abraham that the people who blessed Israel, God would bless. The people who cursed Israel, God would curse. Edom's pride had from the very beginning led them to sin against God's people. God viewed the way that Edom treated Israel as sin against him to the point that he's actually judging them for their sin. They they had an elevated view of themselves and I don't just mean due to the fact that they were 5,700 feet up in the air. I just, both, both literally and figuratively they had an elevated view of themselves and looked down upon the people of Israel. You know, it's interesting, it is our pride that ultimately leads us to sin against God, just as it was for the people of Edom. Pride causes us to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. In fact, what we do is we look at God's righteous standard and we somehow think ourselves above it. C.S. Lewis put it this way. I love using C.S. Lewis quotes, the guy's brilliant. He said, in God, you come up against something which is in every respect immeasurably superior to yourself. Unless you know God as that and therefore know yourself as nothing in comparison, you do not know God at all. Just a little side note, by the way. Do you know that in, in 
there are churches out there, one of, the, one of the, the teachings that they teach is that you can be little gods. This, I'm not talking in a cult, I'm talking in so-called Christian churches, it's this little God theology. It's kind of terrifying, to be quite honest. Lewis has it right here, he says, in God you come up against something which is in every respect immeasurably superior to yourself. Unless you know God as that, and therefore know yourself as nothing in comparison, you do not know God at all. As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people, and of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. What does scripture tell us? God bless you. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to who? The humble, the one who recognizes his low place in comparison to God, right? That's the one that God gives grace to. But the proud, he opposes. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the one that God opposes. That kind of force against me, is a, that's a battle I can't win. <laughs> the idea of God opposing you, that's terrifying. But I like what Lewis says here. He says, as long as you're proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is looking down on things and people. And really, if you consider about this fact, every time that you sin, no matter what it is, every time that you sin, what you're actually doing is you're taking a look at God's righteous, holy standard, right? And you're saying, huh, I'm gonna go with my way, not yours. That is looking down on God's standard. That's looking down on what God has said. And I'm saying, no, I'm gonna do it my way, God. I'm gonna go by my standard of righteousness, my standard of goodness, my standard of morality, my standard of behavior. I'm gonna do what I want to do. That's, I don't care what sin you can describe for me, all of them fit into that category. Because God condemns all sin. And if we embrace a sin, we're saying, I'm going to ignore what you say, God, and I'm going to elevate what I want to do above what you've said. That's pride. And pride always will lead us into sin. One of the ways that helps us to keep from sinning is to be constantly reminded of what? The infinite greatness of God and the complete depravity of man to realize just how wretched I am and how great God is and how much I need to him. What does that do for the Christian? It brings them to the cross and says, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my, even my inclinations towards sin and help me. We need to constantly be reminded of, of who God is and who, we, and who we are. That's one of the reasons why we sing some of these hymns in this church that are so beautiful. And we talk about holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty right? Boy, that helps us to put things in perspective, doesn't it? When, when, we, when we recognize how great he is and how, how great we aren't. You see, we're not Christians because we're naturally like Christ. No, actually we're Christians because of God's amazing, sovereign, undeserved act of grace on our behalf at the cross of Calvary. None of us deserved it. None of us were good enough. The ones, again, the ones who think that they're good enough, what are they? They're proud. What does God do to the proud? He opposes them. One of my concerns has always been that there are too many voices in the church that do nothing but tell us how wonderful we are. You never have to worry about that from me. <laughs> we have churches just telling people how great they are. Well, if we're all so great, then why did Christ die? We, Christ died because we're not very great and we need a savior desperately. We need all the gospel. And it's always going to include a recognition of our great sin and God's great grace. Finally, pride leads to destruction. Edom's pride was its ultimate downfall. They were punished by God for their sinful acts against Israel. We find that in uh, verses 17 and 18. But in Mount Zion there shall be those who escape, and it shall be holy. And the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. 
and the house of Esau stubble. That means burnt. <laughs> For Edom, judgment would be final. It was their pride that led them to sin. Their sin would be judged. And really, I think that helps us to picture how God deals with all of mankind. All the way back in the Garden of Eden, man did what? Listen to the serpent? That prideful creature said what? You can be like God. He just spoke right to that pride, right? And, and Adam responded and said, yeah, sounds good. Hand me that fruit. I always find that interesting. I've probably said it before here. I say it repeatedly, but you know, we always want to beat up on Eve for grabbing that fruit, but it tells us in Genesis that knucklehead Adam was standing right next to her. So can't very well blame Eve when you're right there next to her. You could have said, uh, sweetheart, you might want to leave that alone. No, what's he say? <laughs> Is it good? I'll have a bite. And ever since then, men have been hoping that their wife would make great food. And mine does. And that has nothing to do with what I was going to say. Man's pride led him into sin. And we're all paying the consequences for it, aren't we? And God brought judgment. And every tribe and people and nation will eventually be judged. Those who persist in their pride will face eternal destruction. What a sad reality. And you know, I think about some of these ones that they have, again, they've, they've put themselves in a position where they feel secure and they've got this fortress around them. And for some, they even come to church. They've got, a good, they've got good church attendance. They get a gold star for how many times they've gone to church and they've given a lot of money and they've done a lot of things that the world would look at and say, oh, those are very admirable deeds and works you've done. And they've built a fortress of pride all around themselves and they say, look how secure I am, look how great I am. And one day they'll stand before God naked and exposed. And he'll say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I, I never knew you. You see, all of us have a pride issue. And we can either lay that pride at the foot of the cross and say, Lord, forgive me for putting my standard, my, myself above your righteous holy standard and find forgiveness, eternal life. Or we can hold on to our pride and face eternal destruction. Will you depend on your good works, so-called? Because God will judge that prideful action, action eternally. Or will you depend on the work of Jesus Christ? That work accomplished at the cross that covers our sinful pride with his forgiveness purchased by his blood. It's a much better option to humble oneself before the Lord, remembering that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its truth. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to look at ourselves and look within at the pride of our heart, Lord, that ultimately, Lord, left undealt with will bring us to destruction. Help us, Lord, to be humble. Confessing our sin and placing our faith in Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sin and eternal life. Thank you that you've made that way possible for all of us, Lord Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.